This is Duke University. This is office hours at Duke University. Today, Duke University Medical Center professor Jeffrey Greeson takes your questions about handling holiday stress. Greeson is a clinical health psychologist at Duke Integrative Medicine, as well as an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Last year, he co-authored a chapter in the Clinical Handbook of Mindfulness on Mindfulness and Anxiety Disorders. To ask Professor Greeson a question, send an email to live at duke.edu, tweet with the tag Duke Live, or post to the Duke University Facebook page. Tell us what you think. Fill out the brief survey on the Duke Office Hours website. You can watch today's discussion again anytime on Duke On Demand. I'm James Todd with Duke's News Office, and I am here with Professor Jeffrey Greeson. He is a clinical health psychologist at Duke Integrative Medicine and also an assistant professor in Duke's Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Professor Greeson, thank you for holding your office hours online. My pleasure. Happy to do it. So we're here to talk about handling holiday stress. Now, uh, many of us have stress at times throughout the year, but in your practice as a clinical psychologist, what problems do you see are more pronounced during the holidays? Well, during the holidays, uh, I think some of the most pronounced things people feel are a sense of time urgency, mm -hmm. that they, their normal routines can get thrown out of whack, you know, that there are gifts to be bought, um, parties to attend, things to cook, uh, things that aren't part of people's normal everyday schedule. And so trying to work in all of those expectations and added activities can definitely add to people's perception of how stressful their life is around the holidays. And you mentioned time, and you've actually, a way of thinking about this is different categories of stress, time being one of them, but what are the other categories of stress? Yeah, so in addition to that sense of time urgency or time stress, there are a number of other uh, sources of stress that people often experience, um, including the people that, that I work with um, at Duke Integrative Medicine. So uh, a couple of other examples are food stress, especially around the times of the holidays, many um, rich, customary types of foods, and, and they're very enjoyable. They're, they're traditional, they're part of our routines, and they're very enjoyable. And um, at the same time, they can be have more calories. Um, people can overeat, you know, the amounts of those based on it being in a party setting or, or what have you, or Thanksgiving or something like that. But so food can end up being a stressor, both in terms of the expectations around them, just the abundance and availability of them. And um, because they're more caloric, that it can contribute to people's, you know, weight gain. So there's food stress and then there's uh, people stress, there are parties, you know, people that we may need to be around in parties or even family members when, during family gatherings that may push our buttons and what have you. So time stress, food stress, people stress, and uh, even world stress that people uh, have a sense of empathy or compassion mm -hmm. or, or the sense of suffering for what's happening in the world. And it could be within their family or their town or um, the, the country or the world itself. And so those are several different types of stress that people experience all the time, but particularly at the holidays. Now you mentioned eating, and of course that's a big one that comes up, dieting and putting on weight, but what's an, an integrative medicine approach to eating during the holidays? Um, so from an integrative uh, approach, we look at eating um, as more than just eating particular foods. So it's more than just um, for the nutritional value of the food. You know, foods are um, part of rituals, customs, they're part of our enjoyment. So from an integrative standpoint, in the ideal world, it would be nice if people could get perhaps more enjoyment out of less food. So how can we do that? Well, maybe by eating those same foods, but by eating them more mindfully. So it may become more about the quality of how we eat versus the quantity and that's what's, what's quality eating then? so quality mm -hmm. eating would be say if um, say if we had a piece of uh, Thanksgiving pump pumpkin pie you know here and whatever the the size was of the piece uh, maybe it's loaded up with with whipped cream you know that's something I, I definitely enjoy that's probably why I'm thinking of it now but mm -hmm. um, maybe the expectation is if we're served a slice of pie we need to eat that entire slice well from the mindfulness perspective of an integrative medicine approach, that's just a thought. That is just an expectation and a judgment 
And it, it may not be a fact. We don't have to eat that. Maybe we just become aware that's an expectation. Just from the very first bite of the pie to notice everything about it, you know, the, the um, kind of soft texture of it, the different flavors and tastes of it. Is it cool? Is it room temperature? Um, the feeling of, of chewing it, even raising the bite, you know, to your mouth and putting it back down. So just to, if eating can become a moment by moment um, practice, then it doesn't really become so much about how much of the pie we eat, but how much we enjoy each and every bite. And then however much we eat, that will take care of itself. As we, no as we notice our satisfaction of the flavors and all of that, we may become satisfied much sooner and maybe we don't even feel the need to have the rest of it. We're satisfied at whatever point it is where we reach that. This is Office Hours at Duke University. I'm here with Professor Jeffrey Greeson. He's talking about handling holiday stress you're invited to participate in this conversation by sending a question by email, by Twitter, or by Facebook. Professor Greeson, we've got a question in here from a viewer from Diana on Facebook, and she asks, I'm adding a lavender sachet to my, quote, holiday relaxation survival kit, like a first aid kit, for my desk at work and one for home. Would you suggest some other items to soothe the senses? Of course, I have to replace the chocolate often. The idea for the kit was in an article by Brian Luke Seward. So physical items. Right. I, I, the idea of um, enjoying the senses, that's mm. very much a part of, uh, of, of living mindfully, being more in touch with uh, the moments of everyday life in a, in a manner that's enjoyable, pleasurable. So the lavender sachet is a great example of um, it smells nice. It smells good. It, the smell is not only pleasant and soothing, it's also calming to the mind, to the emotions. If our senses are um, pleasant, if the mind is kind of quiet and at ease, is the body going to be stressed or is the body going to begin relaxing? It's going to begin relaxing. Are we going to sleep better or sleep more tense? Going to sleep better. So it's amazing how something like an item like the lavender sachet can not just be a pleasant sensory experience, it can help with you know, mental well-being, even sleep, um, just a mind-body response to that. Other things that could be helpful um, like that may be um, some people enjoy taking w warm baths with a um, aromatic essential oil like a lavender or maybe you know peppermint or something like that that could also be um, very pleasant and enjoyable just to the senses. It's warm, it's soothing, it smells good, kind of like the lavender. Um, other things that people sometimes enjoy are um, sounds, you know, so the sounds of um, an instrumental music, you know, things that can kind of trigger that relaxation response, that quietness and that sense of ease um, that the caller was uh, mentioning. So there are a variety of things like that that can be very enjoyable and helpful, especially this time of year. I mean, so far we've talked about things that you can have some direct control of. Do I eat this piece of pie or not? Do I have a comfortable item? But when you think of holiday stress, I mean, I picture the family's gathering and your brother-in-law says, oh, that Obama health care stinks, and suddenly the tension in the room goes way up. Is there a mindful response to, to a situation like that where you don't have direct control? Yeah, that's a great example. Um, I can definitely identify with, with that example from uh, you know interactions with my own family and friends. Mm -hmm. So it's a reality. That's a, that's a great real life example. And um, the first thing I, I think of when that type of interaction or tense reaction is happening, it's forming, is number one that sometimes just paying attention is enough. And what I mean by that is just the awareness of the as those things are said that may compete with our own way of looking at things the muscles may begin tensing, mm -hmm. the jaw may begin, ten we can maybe feel our heart start to race or something, or our breathing gets a little uh, shallower. Those signs of the stress reaction beginning to form, just by paying attention and noticing that that's happening without even having to do anything, just paying attention itself helps us feel it, but not feed it. And there's a big difference between having a automatic habitual reaction when that happens versus simply sensing, observing, and really allowing it to unfold moment by moment. That's part of a mindfulness practice that helps us not feed into getting entangled into that kind of tug of war or struggle that can easily happen unless we're paying attention to it and allowing it mindfully. So the trick is maybe we don't even need to do anything other than be aware that that's happening, maybe even know that could have the potential to happen ahead of time, and that can help us practice the quality we call non-reactivity. We can feel it, but not feed it. Now, what's the difference between non-reactivity and passivity? I mean, say you want to win that healthcare debate argument. 
Exactly. So if, um, and here's where the wisdom of all of this comes in. Um, uh, allowance and mindfulness is definitely not synonymous with um, passivity or being submissive or, or getting walked all over. You know, it's actually a kind of attitude of, of empowerment and assertiveness and making a proactive choice that we can feel in control. So if we do want to kind of argue or contend, you know, that kind of point from our perspective so that we feel like we're kind of, you know, leveling the playing field or something, to, you know, A, maybe know that that has the potential to happen ahead of time, feel the reaction kind of forming, like I said. And then the third step would be once we've kind of uh, avoided that initial, you know, maybe angry reaction, to just have a m kind of more calm sense of poise when we respond. We can respond more wisely, skillfully, non-aggressively. Um, and that would probably lead to a more effective interchange and, you know, mutual respect and to keep it from kind of exploding and maybe ruining the whole gathering. Professor Griesman, we've got a couple more questions mm -hmm. that have come in and everyone watching is invited to participate in this Office Hours conversation on handling holiday stress. You can do that by email, by Twitter or Facebook. This question comes by email from Laura talking about enjoying every bite of food. Why are Americans very different about this versus, let's say, the French? Do they practice more integrative medicine or mindfulness? Why are Americans all about supersizing it rather than enjoying every bite slowly? Right. So that's a great point, a great question about um, cultural differences in our habits and customs. So Europe versus the U.S. There can be different norms. So, you know, some of the key U.S. norms are uh, multitasking, efficiency, productivity, those may not overlap so well with the kind of values of, of savoring, being a connoisseur of, you know, dessert or wine where um, sort of less of it is more enjoyable, not more of it is more enjoyable, you know, whereas in the U.S. the whole idea of supersizing things, you know, more is better, newer is better, faster is better, doing more at a time is better. In, in some sense, those are values that may pay off in a way but it's also important to consider the other side of the coin with those same values in terms of chronic stress and fatigue and burnout, maybe getting less pleasure from more in terms of foods like that. So just that, that point about different cultures, different norms, being aware of what we value and making a wise choice as to, hmm, you know, based on what I value, is more more or is more less? You mm -hmm. know, so that, that's a good point. And, and we talk about um, savoring food and having comfortable items are these kind of approaches luxuries? I mean, do you need some disposable income in order to have the kind of the time to do this and to, you know, seek out uh, guidance? How, how do you, in your own practice, how do you see that? If people really do need to get to work, really need to, to, to do three things at once, um, can those folks still practice mindfulness? Right. So from, um, so there are a couple of parts to that answer. One, in terms of can can um, people practice mindfulness? The good news is mindfulness is something that we already have, each one of us. The ability to pay attention to what's happening, to do that purposefully in the moment, it's a natural capacity and quality. We all have it. With practice, it's only going to get stronger. So everybody can practice this. And there are um, meditation practices, you know, online that are free, or there are CDs that are, you know, less than ten dollars that, that people can find on mindfulness meditation. So it's a key point that it's a natural quality we all have. We can cultivate it in ways that don't have to take up a lot of time and that don't have to be expensive. So that's from the mindfulness perspective. In terms of the other products, from the lavender sachets mm -hmm. to the um, whatever else. There are a range of products at a range of, you know, website stores from very inexpensive of a couple of dollars, mm -hmm. like a sachet maybe, to more expensive, you know, eight-week meditation classes, joining memberships, those may be more. So, um, but there's no one right way. If people can make it their own, realize that there are different options and just kind of pick one, see how it affects them, that's the way to go at whatever level people are at in terms of money or time. Okay. We've got another question that's come in. This one's from Kevin by email, and he asks, where does positive thinking fit into these stressful situations? I'm a fan of Louise Hay, and I've read The Secret, and I'm inspired by these positive messages. How can positive thinking help the stress of holidays? What about Im imagery of a successful holiday before it occurs? I love that idea. Mm -hmm. um, this absolutely ties into the idea of how stress affects the body and in turn our health in potentially um, adverse and ill ways. 
and the flip side of that is, well, if we can avoid the stress response, what about promoting a relaxation response where we can rest and digest? What about the difference between um, negative kind of automatic thinking of you know berating ourselves, judging ourselves with harsh criticism, um, wishing we've done more with our time, what have you? That is going to exacerbate the stress response that we're already having, probably prolong it and make it more chronic, raising blood pressure and inflammation and things like that can affect our health versus the more positive ways of thinking or the positive emotions of appreciation, gratitude, kindness, compassion, love. Those things, if we're cultivating those, those in the mind, brain, and body are going to translate into more healthy um, relationships and behavior. So yeah, absolutely, probably feeding into the positive emotions and positive ways of thinking is something um, very worthwhile doing uh, during this time of year um, where we're connecting with other people and ourselves and probably throughout the, the entire year. We've been speaking about mindful responses, so let's let's take a moment to get mindful here. I mean, what's what's practically? I mean, we're not going to be quiet for five minutes, but right, right. what are the practical steps to get centered, get mindful? Okay, so um, for well, just for you and I doing this demonstration here for people practicing at home, and if they'd like to pursue this, there are a couple of key tips, you know, to a kind of mindfulness one hundred and one, you know, meditation practice, if you will. Mm -hmm. The first thing is for people to realize that um, we want to embody the practice. And, and what that means is if we're doing a, a mindfulness meditation practice where we're trying to become, you know, um, we're paying attention, we're wakeful, we're alert, we're dignified, we want to embody that in our posture. So sitting in a way um, where the body is uh, wakeful and dignified and alert, you know, the hands just kind of, you know, resting in the lap and so forth, and just feeling the breath, you know, coming into the body, feeling the movement of the breath in the lungs or the belly, and then flowing out. And just noticing that breath actually moving in the body and relaxing into the posture that's wakeful and dignified and alert, and yet not too rigid, you know, it's comfortable. So it's a comfortable practice to do, it's natural, just watching the natural flow, the sensations of the breath. As that's happening, people might begin to notice, oh, you know, what am I doing after this session? Oh, I got to get back to, those are just thoughts, you know, coming through the mind as naturally as the breath coming through the body, you know. So just to kind of note that that happens, bring the attention back to noticing the sensations mm -hmm. of the breath. And people could practice that for five breaths, five minutes, you know, maybe even 15 minutes, depending on how much time they have. But that's the idea. Allow the body to... Um, kind of capture these qualities of mindfulness and its posture, notice the sensations of the breath as thoughts are happening to include that as part of the practice. There's as much mindfulness in noticing a train of thought as there is in noticing the sensations of the breath. They're both part of mindfulness practice. So that's basically how people begin to practice um, for the mindfulness meditation perspective. This is Office Hours at Duke University. Professor Jeffrey Greeson is talking about handling stress during the holidays. You're invited to participate in the conversation by email, by Twitter, or by Facebook. Uh, we've got another question that's come in here by Facebook from Ho uh, Hadini, if I'm saying that right. It's our family loves buffet restaurants. So eating, I'm talking about eating. And we go out more frequently during the holidays. I tend to eat more at buffets. Should I avoid buffets or try and control my eating? That is, what would Jeffrey suggest for people at buffets, practical tips other than just enjoying every bite? Buffets, I have to admit, I love buffets myself. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, any time of year, including you know the holidays. So there are a couple of important things to keep in mind in terms of uh, the buffet example. Number one is um, buffets are created and designed with a specific purpose in mind. It connects back to the values of our society. More is better, getting a better deal, that's good. Um, all you can eat, supersized. These are all expectations. Some of them we're not even completely conscious of. We go there, we may not even be aware of all those things. How there's also research on mindless eating by Brian Wansink at uh, Cornell. How things are labeled on the buffet line. If things are just labeled green beans versus you know Mama's seasoned country green beans, and there's two bins of them on the one side with the fancier label, that's gone. On the other one, they're hardly touched. So even the how things are named can influence how much we eat, how big the plates are. So a buffet um, setting is gonna make it more challenging. But again, what I was saying before is number one, just walking in there knowing that that's the case. As you're in line, paying attention to 
How does the body feel? How hungry, you know, are we when we go to a buffet? Are we really, really hungry or not so much? You know, you could even kind of rate that to some, um, and hunger in the belly versus the hunger in the mind of wanting and, and craving and just noticing that that's there. And then going through the line, maybe um, taking a smaller plate to go through the first time, get a few things you like, and then eating, you know, looking at it, smelling, even eating it very mindfully, perhaps even um, just being mindful and appreciative of all those different foods. Where did they come from? Looking at all the colors, whose work went into preparing all of this at the restaurant or even where it was farmed or what. And just, it kind of interrupts the habitual pattern of just wolfing it all down. In fact, quite the opposite. It makes it even that much more enjoyable, richer, and um, satisfying. And if that ends up uh, leading to having less of those rich foods, well, then that's all the better. But it can both be more enjoyable, and we can end up having less of it by approaching it in that way. So we're talking about the environment, the physical building. Actually, I want to bring in, uh, as a contrast, images of the building uh, at uh, Duke Integrative Medicine, where you work, certainly is the very intentional of the architecture of the place. So let's see, let's look at some of those images, but maybe just, just talk us through about um, kind of a, a virtual guided tour of mm -hmm. integrative medicine, just a few points about um, how the building's architecture encourages mindfulness. Yeah, this is another um, very important point is there's a, a key role and um, at Duke Integrative Medicine we have this idea of there's a wheel of health with different domains to it and we may touch on that in a little bit, but the physical environment is one of those features. So on the picture that's being shown now, the architects that designed this building designed it with the principles of integrative medicine, including mindfulness as a foundation in mind. So as you look at this, you can notice all the natural elements. There's woodwork, there's stone, there's greenery, there are arches that are kind of throughout Duke's campus. So there are connections, natural elements here. And as people come in through that initial hallway, it's almost as if they're feeling, you know, embraced or welcomed into this healing space, this healing place. And just from noticing how it's built, the, the qualities that went into it, the colors, et cetera, it draws people in, not only physically into the building, but draws them into the present moment where they're more present, they're more centered, probably going to be more receptive to their um, meeting with the physician or for their massage or whatever they end up having. So there's an intimate connection between the physical space and people's presence and receptivity um, to healing potential. This is an office hours conversation at Duke University. We're talking about handling holiday stress. Professor Jeffrey Gleason is a clinical health psychologist at Duke Integrative Medicine. You can participate in this conversation by email, by Twitter, or by Facebook. Uh, Professor Gleason, we've got another question that's come in, this one by email from Stuart, and he asks, are there other relaxation techniques that should ideally become part of our culture? Power naps, yoga, time for meditation. Right. Um, so Stuart's hitting on something that's really important that's also part of our wheel of health, which is the balance between activity and rest, the balance between doing and being. We're called human beings, not human doings, mm -hmm. although it's debatable as to how we spend most of our time. Most of it is spent doing, getting back to the values of, of the country, etc. Um, in terms of building in relaxation practices for the body, for the mind, to restore energy, et cetera, that could end up influencing our sleep, which is related to our health and our ability to function the next day. Um, meditation is, is one possibility, but there are also many others. So he had mentioned yoga. Yoga is um, a way to embody a meditative um, state, but through postures, stretches, the physical body is the vehicle for the mindfulness versus the breath, although that's also bodily in a sense as well. But through doing a set of, of yoga practices or yoga postures, people can begin to realize, hmm, you know, I never knew that knot was back there, or mm -hmm. wow, you know, my hamstrings are really tight. A level of awareness that perhaps wasn't tapped, you know, until people did that yoga practice. And yoga comes from yoke, you know, yoking the body and the mind together. So the yoga practice can be good. There are also um, a variety of mind-body uh, relaxation practices. One's called progressive muscle relaxation, where it teaches people to go through the major muscle groups and to kind of tense and hold a set of, you know, like the fists and the forearms for five or six seconds and then let that go and to notice the difference between a state of tension 
versus a state of relaxation and letting go. And that's an, a nice way for people to learn too. And be, you know, we could do that in bed or in our office as a couple minute break during the day. And it can teach the difference between stress and tension, noticing that in the body and how we can let that go um, so that the stress doesn't continue to build. So all of those are relaxation techniques that anyone can do. People can learn these quickly, freely, and it doesn't have to take much time to have a beneficial effect from them. So we've been talking about yoga, meditation, uh, mindfulness, but in the world of integrative medicine, uh, holistic medicine, alternative medicine, how have you de described this? Um, you know, uh, herbs, sweat lodges, acupuncture, uh, are all alternative medicines created equal? Right, well, certainly not. So there are a variety of um, healing systems throughout the world, so there's Chinese medicine in China. There's Native American medicine with shamanism and the rituals and the sweat lodges and um, you know different uh, spirit guides and uh, so and there's Western biomedicine with microbes and germs and developing vaccines and drugs to specifically target you know receptors that are part of a disease you know pathway. There's certainly value to all of these traditional healing systems um, throughout the world. They're each capable of healing, perhaps through different mechanisms and pathways. So the idea of integrative medicine versus one system or another is what if we could bring clinicians and people that are trained in Chinese medicine, herbal medicine, mind-body medicine like meditation and yoga, nutrition, foods, plants, and herbs, acupuncture all together under one roof like we do here in a rigorous credentialed way to give people more options, more healing potential and to be able to personalize that and customize that given uh, the patient's interest, what they are willing and interested to do and to begin there and if it blossoms from there that's great and if not you go with what the person's interested in most and the more options there, there are um, the more flexibility people feel like they have with all of this. Are, are there any red flags out there? I mean you're a clinical psychologist licensed here in North Carolina. I mean if a patient says to you, you know, I've got a sham and I'm going to go take peyote this weekend and I'll, I'll see you next week. Do, do you, I mean is there ever a line where you say, oh I'd be careful of that one? Right, so there, there are a couple of uh, important points with this is one, um, when it comes to stress and health and stress reduction and different kinds of therapies, be it psychotherapy or a meeting with a physician mm -hmm. or any other type of clinician, um, it's key to go to somebody that is credentialed in their field. You know, Duke Medical Center, everyone that works here is, is a very rigorous credentialing process versus other people can um, practice in the community. They may not have to go through a credentialing process. So for patients out there that are interested in learning about mind-body techniques or integrating herbs or massage or acupuncture, I certainly encourage each person to check into the healthcare provider's credentials. Are they board certified? Are they certified by the national body in their profession? Where are they working? Is it a, at an academic medical center or somewhere else in the community? To so just do a little background research on that. Um, another uh, issue that's kind of outside the, my scope of practice, it's part of integrative medicine, but I don't practice it personally, is say supplements and herbs. They're not FDA regulated like medications are. So some studies have been done showing that some pills, you know, like melatonin or St. John's wort, they may not have any melatonin in them. Mm -hmm. Or it may be exactly what the bottle says. But if they're not regulated by the FDA, we simply can't know for sure. So that affects our uh, decision making as healthcare consumers and patients. You know, we don't want to put ourselves in harm's way with these things that may not be regulated or going to people that may not have the highest credentials in their field. So those are a couple of tips. Professor Grison, we've got another question that's come in here, and everyone watching is invited to participate in this conversation by email, by Twitter, or by Facebook. So Frank, he's written in and says, I like the idea that we are beings rather than doing, something you just said. How can we teach this to our children? I have a feeling that my kids are constantly stimulated, whether it's video games, iPods, friends, classes, etc., and I can tell my kids are a lot more stressed than I ever was at their age. How can I keep my kids, quote, engaged without stressing them out? teaching children stress techniques, or even in schools teaching stress techniques? Excellent question. Um, it was Frank, I believe, right? So, yes. so Frank is hitting on something that is really beginning to um, become a movement and blossom in this country. The idea of why wait until we're adults or until we're sick or having some kind of symptoms to begin practicing all mm -hmm. of this stuff. What about beginning to learn it as we're children? 
there are a few things I can think of with that. One, it's already beginning to happen. So say from the mindfulness perspective, the mindfulness meditation perspective, um, through the Center for Mindfulness at University of Massachusetts with John Kabat-Zinn and Saki Santorelli and, and their colleagues, they have programs where they're now working with schools and teachers to incorporate mindfulness meditation practices, this kind of attention and self-regulation training, if you will, emotional awareness and intelligence to the children. And they're going to be studying how that affects um, behavior, you know, are, how well are they doing in the classroom, their academic performance. They can even give them sort of these tests of uh, um, attention and concentration and executive function, these neuropsychological neuropsych tests, and see, hmm, do the, do the kids that get this training start to do better on these standardized tests of um, thinking and memory and, and um, performance and attention versus kids that don't get the training. So it's certainly starting to happen in the schools and it could even be um, positively influencing potentially their ability to perform to their potential. In terms of the overstimulated uh, aspect mm -hmm, of, right. of the point, which is no, another key one that gets at the time we spend doing versus the time we spend being, um, uh, it's, it's often true that people live on autopilot so much of the time, and again, adults or children, that it's, it's, if we're engaged in gaming or something like that, virtual reality, these, we're only partly where we are and we're partly engaged somewhere else, uh, uh, some fantasy land in a game or whatever it might be, an avatar or something. It's like watching a webcast. Uh, a, a, a webcast, exactly. So um, maybe an, an antidote to kind of balance that out is... Um, if there's too much time going toward the overstimulating things or the things that are kind of fragmenting our attention and presence to just balance that out with more time for being doing one thing at a time that builds the skills of concentration and kind of receptivity and awareness versus the multitasking fragmented. And that could be done maybe as a family. It sometimes can be hard to expect one person in the family to be doing this stuff while everyone else is uh, watching television or doing their internet gaming. So maybe um, it could be part of togetherness as a family to take the walk, that's part of the exercise, to not have it be about the destination, but about the walk itself, step by step, just like breath by breath. What are we noticing as the season changes? What the cool air feels like? And, just to notice the um, level of uh, richness of the conversation in a moment or an activity like that versus, oh, I've got to be back in half an hour. Let's go. Those may be two totally different types of experiences. So those are a few thoughts about um, those kind of issues between kids and adults. You know, talking about all these practices and balancing family life, um, I think people are often curious, uh, okay, doctor, what do you do? What, what's your own practice with these things? Yeah, great question. So, um, it's, uh, it's definitely easiest to, um, to teach and recommend based on a place of, of true knowing through direct experience and having done these things. So I've practiced mindfulness meditation, I think uh, it's been about since the winter of 97, and I've been pretty good about keeping up that meditation practice. It's waxed and waned like it does with many people, but there are kind of two values of practicing something over time. One is taking the time each day to do it, which can help contribute to that balance and mm -hmm. stress reduction we were talking about. It's also, I look at um, practicing the meditation or eating mindfully or, or the yoga that I've practiced a little bit, not as much as the meditation, is that it's an incremental process. Each time we practice, our level of awareness is always rising. It's never going to be decreasing. So there's kind of a lifelong learning, a developmental trajectory to all of this. And uh, that can be something uh, that's just interesting to folks mm. and to know that mm. each time you do it, it can kind of begin to have a cumulative effect. So as we do it ourselves, much easier to share it with our kids, teach students about it, um, uh, offer it to patients or clients that we work with because we're benefiting from it ourselves. And so what's your own testimony? I mean, were you a, a jerk in 1996? And now look, <laughs> you know, look how far you've come and what, what's, what effect have you seen? Right, so th what, um, what led to me getting into all of this? So mm -hmm. I initially, I was interested in biology and health, but I really didn't have any, you know, I wasn't aware of integrative medicine or these complementary therapies uh, in college. What, what kind of precipitated it for me is I had uh, two knee injuries in college when I played basketball. One was my sophomore year, one was my senior year. So this 97 was my senior year one. So I was going to miss part of the season for that. I had torn it up a second time. I was definitely, you know, angry and upset that that had happened. It was 
physically painful, it hurt. I had to have the surgery the second time, be in this brace for a few months. So it had a lot of limitations and it was a very stressful process. I, I noticed I was not sleeping as well. I was getting sick more often, even though I was physically fit and eating pretty well at the time. So I'm starting to put two and two together, stress, illness, pain, maybe what could account for that? Hmm, stress influences the immune system. It decreases the immune system function, more likely to get sick that way. Hmm, that's interesting. So the personal experience led to um, discovering these uh, techniques for stress reduction, like mindfulness was one of the first practices I sort of discovered. Um, and I have to credit my wife, uh, Johanna, with mailing me the first book at Christmas and I kind of remember reading it you know that night and then practicing you know washing the dishes or my hands and making that part of my mindfulness practice or petting our pets that's part of being present too everyday things like that and so the personal experience translated into the things I noticed in my own life that sparked a scientific interest which is a big reason why I'm interested in the science and the kind of brain mechanisms and immune mechanisms that might account for the health benefits of these practices we've been talking about so far today. And let's pick up on that. You have a National Institutes of Health grant to do that very thing. Look at empirical evidence for these uh, complementary uh, holistic approaches to health. So it's probably hard to summarize all that research in, in just a few minutes, but you know, what, what's some of the insights that you've gained through that? Yeah, so one thing that we've uh, been learning through the project that, that I got funded a couple of years ago, it's part of um, NIH has what they're called career development awards, so for um, young scientists entering the field to be able to support their time to investigate these kind of scientific mechanisms for how do these mind-body therapies like mindfulness-based stress reduction, and in my case, how do they work, you know, what explains it? And so that's what my grant is, is looking at. So some of the things that I've presented so far is we've found that um, particularly for people that take this eight-week mindfulness meditation class that we offer at the center, and it's offered probably in most states around the country, the, the mindfulness-based stress reduction program, is that people that come into it, they typically have higher levels of anxiety, significant levels of sleep problems, um, lots of physical symptoms of stress in terms of the muscle tension and fatigue and irritability. And what we found, some of the findings so far, are that people that have the sleep problems report needing to take less sleep medication at the end of the eight weeks compared to when they started the course. So that's something very significant. Maybe they don't need to take as much medication. That's nice. It may cost less. There may be um, just less kind of chemicals in the body because they've learned to manage some of the stressors or whatever may have been perturbing their sleep to manage them by themselves. May need less medication. Other, we had, we're talking about the balance between the positive and negative emotions a little while ago. Um, it's interesting that the stress reduction is not a, just about reducing the negative emotions and the kind of irritable states of mind. It also enhances the positive qualities and states of mind like gratitude and happiness and compassion and kindness. So those kinds of qualities are increasing with this training and that can translate into health benefits as well. So those are a few of the things that we've been finding so far. Professor Gleason, uh, Houdini asked a question before and has come back with another question. I want to get to that. Everyone watching is invited to participate in this Office Hours conversation on handling holiday stress. Professor Jeffrey Gleason is a clinical health psychologist at Duke Integrative Medicine. So Houdini asks uh, on Facebook here, do you think there will remain a split in the nomenclature between, quote, integrative medicine and, quote, Western traditional medicine, or will they merge? And if so, when? Yeah, that's a great question. That's, um, from, from integrative medicine's perspective, that's at the crux, at the heart of um, the future of healthcare and possibly of, of he upcoming healthcare reform is, uh, w will these ideas of, you know, patient-centered care, the availability of multiple systems of medicine at one place, um, if that can become evidence-based and relatively safe and effective, is that going to just become good medicine with no particular label, or is it going to still be kind of siloed as complementary therapies or integrative medicine? So it's an open question, but I think um, what's going to influence that and the time frame of it depends in large part on the research. So that's why having uh, NIH agencies that fund this work is important, because without uh, credible scientific research to support integrative approaches to medicine, that's really going to limit its uh, accessibility and its availability throughout the country. So the research is key. Training is another key that um, many medical schools now, I think at least 42 medical schools throughout 
uh, the US and Canada are part of a consortium of academic health centers for integrative medicine. They are helping to teach the medical students and the residents, educating the physicians at those health systems. So gradually, gradually there are fellowships in integrative medicine now. The kind of um, education and training is blossoming too so that more people will be available to, to treat us uh, that are aware of, of how to integrate these different types of therapies. So I think it is happening in terms of how it unfolds from here and the, the labels that remains to be seen. And how would you characterize the climate among your peers in a medical profession? I mean, do you, there, there are skeptics out there. Mm -hmm. are, are, do you find that that you're constantly defending your practice or that there's an increasing acceptance? What, what's the climate? I'd say the climate uh, is probably influenced by two main things. One is the state of the science. People read academic journals, New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, most physicians read the highest profile medical journals where it's very difficult to get publications in those journals. They're mostly drug studies, new devices mm -hmm. um, that have huge sample sizes in those studies, tens or thousands or even tens of thousands of patients funded by you know, pharmaceutical companies, or so. so it takes a lot of funding to carry out a really large trial to change medical practice. With lots of the complementary and alternative therapies that are used in integrative medicine, massage, acupuncture, meditation, herbs, no one really owns those things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of them are just natural qualities or natural products that um, if there's no real impetus to invest in them for a large-scale trial with thousands of people, it's difficult to accrue the evidence to publish in the best journals. It's starting to happen through this National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine at NIH, so the science is, is beginning to rise. The other key factor is direct personal experience, so kind of like you asked me about the mindfulness meditation experience, I've seen quite a number of um, nurses and physicians and surgeons at Duke uh, that have, you know, come to see me before they had their own surgery to learn uh, meditation or kind of self-hypnosis to help them reduce the stress and anxiety of the procedure, help manage the pain. Um, those kinds of approaches are associated with needing less medication, having fewer complications when people have surgery. So the other key factor is uh, clinic, clinicians and healthcare providers own direct experience with these things, and that's the other way of knowing in addition to the science. Let me bring up another kind of skepticism from, from another angle, if you will, is um, people that say, hey, look, I'm a Christian, this meditation stuff, you're trying to turn me into a Buddhist. W what about, how do you answer that kind of skepticism? Right, that's a, another um, legitimate concern, mm -hmm. you know, and as I've heard uh, people describe it, the, the meditation and teachers and instructors that, that I've um, learned from over the years, they say that, you know, we can... Um, practice these universal human qualities of kindness, compassion, presence, attending to the present moment. Um, so we can benefit from some of the philosophies of these uh, world religions and faith traditions, mm -hmm. but in a way that augments or complements ours rather than, um, you know, replaces it or something like that. So it's kind of a both and rather than a, it's either I'm this or I'm that. And I think that's been one role of the academic healthcare center like a Duke or a University of Massachusetts is people realize that we can practice some of these things like meditation that in a way that's complementary and maybe even enhancing of our faith or, or religious tradition rather than in a, a way that you know is out to replace it or compete with it in some way. There's a reason we've got another question that's mm -hmm. come in, this one by email from Tara who asks, can you tell me more about self-hypnosis? How can one use this through childbirth what are some self-hypnosis resources for people who don't have access to your Durham office? Right, great point. So um, within, so self-hypnosis and hypnosis along with meditation and yoga, they're in the realm of a therapy is called mind-body therapy. So it's mm -hmm. any therapy that uses the mind-body connection to, um, to uh, generate mental and emotional states and thoughts and expectations that if we're having those, those are happening in the brain somewhere or else we wouldn't be experiencing them. Once things are happening in the brain, they are in the body. The brain mm -hmm. is the master controller of all the other systems in the body. And so that's how we can use things like hypnosis or meditation to influence systems in the body, physiology, and our health is of course directly related to that. So self-hypnosis is something that I help teach people at Integrative Medicine, but people can learn it on their own through uh, one woman who's an expert in this is Belle Ruth Naperstack, and she's mm -hmm. got a website and um, these 
inexpensive, you know, CDs and MP3s people can download, and some topics are childbirth, managing pain, anxiety, preparing for surgery, etc. And the, the idea with self-hypnosis is to um, kind of, again, you know, reach that highly concentrated and focused state of mind through kind of a relaxation induction or some type of guided imagery. And once we're in that more kind of receptive, relaxed state of mind and body, to give ourselves suggestions and some suggestions can be targeted toward the body that you know say something like um, knowing you know as the the more deeply I relax the more and more stable my my heart rate and breathing begins to be and the more stable it is now and the more I practice the more stable these will be during when I'm giving birth or something like that or with some other procedure and other suggestions could be to um, you know, to remember that as soon as I'm getting stressed out about, you know, the mere thought of, of giving birth to this child, that following on the heels of that, I'll soon remember what a blessing this is and how exciting in the big scheme of things this is going to be. So we kind of take one experience and parlay it into another through these kind of self-suggestions. So it can be relaxing, absorbing, and helping to kind of focus us at the same time. To use that example to talk about this intersection between alternative and, and traditional, I mean, at, at what point does a woman say, you know what, give me the Pitocin. I mean, I'm trying the hypnosis, but because right. there's going to be some pain even when with self-hypnosis. So where do you, you probably come across that like with depression. I mean, at some point you're, you might say to a client, you know what, let's, let's bring in the meds. Where's that line? Yeah. Great point once again, mm -hmm. and I've heard um, several physicians at, at Integrative Medicine, mm -hmm. Dr. Tracy Godet, our executive uh, director, and Dr. Shelley Roth, for example, at OBGYN, they say, don't forget about the medicine in Integrative Medicine, so mm -hmm. the Pitocin or the pain meds or the antidepressants. Integrative Medicine is about inclusion, mm -hmm. not exclusion, and so including medications and devices that have you know good evidence and effectiveness for them. So yes, mm -hmm. it's about integrating the right combination of things in a personalized, customized way that the patient's also on board with and even helping to make the decision. You know, it's a partnership. So the, the line from our point of view is we want to offer anything that can be helpful to a given person or patient and um, to be able to customize that. So it's, again, you know, it's inclusive rather than, oh, no medication, no. Mm -hmm. Professor Griesman, we are uh, well into the office hour here, and I want to make sure that we get to uh, mention one other thing, which is that you and your colleague is also a mentor, uh, Professor Jeffrey Brantley uh, here at Duke and at Duke Integrative Medicine. You all have a chapter out in the clinical handbook uh, of mindfulness. And something that jumped out to me in that is you, you've got a definition of mindfulness in there. Um, let me read it, but I, I imagine you didn't just dash this off. There's a lot of thought that's gone into this. So you say mindfulness is a word that refers to a basic human capacity for non-conceptual, non-judging, and present moment centered awareness. How did, how did you put all those words together to describe mindfulness? Yeah, so it's um, mindfulness is a natural quality, like we said, and as we define in the chapter, but there are many, it, it's multifactorial. There are different facets, different aspects, different qualities to mindfulness. It's, it's more than just attention, it includes these attitudes of compassion, kindness, non judgment, but also behavioral things like not reacting, you know, responding wisely, feeling it, true, but not feeding it, you know, like the pie or whatever examples, uh, the pain management or something. So it's um, in trying to define this kind of idea of mindfulness, it's kind of when the mind is full of awareness, mindfulness, that's one way of thinking about it that's a little simpler, but it is kind of um, another way people talk about it is uh, like John Kabat-Zinn at UMass, uh, coming to our senses. And there's two meanings to that, that we literally are mindful through our sense gates, mm -hmm. tasting, seeing, hearing sounds, noticing um, sensations in the body of tension or maybe relaxation. So we use our kind of inner technology, if you will, to sense things as a vehicle for our mindfulness. And then the other thing to coming to our senses is, come on, <laughs> let's come to our senses here, you know, get out of the autopilot and into mm -hmm. my life, you know, in this moment as it's happening right now, moment by moment. So yeah, it's difficult to define it, but it's an experiential thing, and as people practice, that's really the key. Then they know what it is, and it can be hard to verbalize it, but it's a felt sense type of thing. Okay, and so to wrap it all up here, handling holiday stress, what is one simple thing that everyone can do during the holidays that could help reduce stress? I would say the number one thing that comes to my mind right now is to practice non-judgment 
-hmm. We don't have to criticize ourselves um, in this culture of multitasking, high mm -hmm. expectations. It's a difficult time right now. Economically, it has been for you know a few years now. Still great expectations. People's values may be the same in terms of ambition, good-heartedness, wanting to do a lot of things, but we can stretch ourselves thin. It can be easy to criticize ourselves if we don't make every party. We haven't eaten everything people made or um, we got, we've given gifts and maybe people didn't acknowledge it. But just to have that sense of kind-heartedness, open-heartedness, compassion for ourselves and others in a non-critical, non-judging way, just doing that, it's more of, a, of an attitude or a perspective, that can be equally, if not more important than, than any of these other things. Very good. Professor Greeson, thank you for holding online office hours. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Professor Jeffrey Greeson is a clinical health psychologist at Duke Integrative Medicine. He is also an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences here at Duke. You can watch a recording of this office hours session along with many other Duke videos on the Duke On Demand website at ondemand.duke.edu. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.